Hello everybody and welcome to another interview in my series entitled Successful Entrepreneurs Stories. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend Ed McLaughlin. Now Ed is based in New York and he uh, is a serial entrepreneur. He's an angel funder. In 2001 he was the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. He's about to be an author for the first time which you'll hear more about shortly. He's also a business coach and mentor. So he's very well placed to be sharing his stories and experiences of what it means to be a successful entrepreneur, to be a success in business. So Ed, welcome and thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks so much Adele. I'm excited to participate and hopefully share some good thoughts with your listening audience. Thank you. So Ed, firstly, will you tell our listeners more about your story of, of entrepreneurship, how you came to be an entrepreneur and the journey you've been through over the years. Uh, in short, uh, right out of school, I went to work for a large corporation, IBM, um, and uh, as much as I learned and liked IBM, there was something missing. Um, and uh, I left IBM, joined Hewlett Packard, a little bit smaller company at the time and uh, still felt like something was missing and, and started to realize that my real goal, my love in life, was to become an entrepreneur and start my own business. Uh, I set up a goal to do that. I documented my goal. In 1991, I formed a new company. Um, it had terrific success. We uh, made a profit from the fourth month on. Uh, our customers were happy. Uh, and actually sold the business in 2005 and um, have since opened up a couple of other businesses as well as investing as an angel investor in a number of new businesses. So tell me about the industries that your uh, entrepreneurship ventures were in. The uh, first two uh, businesses, one was in a commercial real estate outsourcing uh, for corporations around the world. Uh, the second was a publishing enterprise. The outsourcing business uh, was, a, was a big success. The publishing uh, was not as much. It, it, for the first three years, it consumed all the profits of the outsourcing business until finally we shut it down. And I realized, uh, well, why did one succeed and the other didn't? Is because, frankly, I had distinctive competence in the real estate outsourcing business and I did not in the publishing business. Hmm, interesting. Well, we'll come on to that in a little more detail in a moment. So what were some of the early challenges uh, and perhaps even fears that you experienced in setting up these businesses and getting them running and profitable? Well, first, for years I struggled with what kind of business. And then uh, as time went on, I realized I need to start a business where I truly have some level of competence that I can offer the world, where I know the customers, I know the business model, that would definitely increase the probability of startup success. Uh, once I realized which business it was going to be, uh, then I needed to really figure out, okay, how much money do I need and how long will it take to get to break even and then profitability. And then lastly, um, when I started my business, uh, I had uh, two children under five um, and I had the thoughts of meeting my personal obligations as well as my business obligations. So those were probably some of the bigger fears I had in starting up. And you grew your businesses um, fairly quickly by the look of, of it and from what you've told me. What was it, how did you do that? How did you go about getting that scale so quickly? Well, I, I think one of the things I benefited from is using some of the knowledge I had from my experiences at IBM and Hewlett Packard about how businesses make money, how they're formed, and probably the key thing above all else was this commitment of pay people based on profit. So we built geographic profit centers and product line profit centers as we expanded the business. And we started out, as I mentioned, in 1991, and by the year 2000, we had approximately 40 offices, including Hong Kong, the Philippines, and uh, in Canada. And the other 37 offices were spread out throughout the United States and all the major cities. 
Wow. So that was uh, mostly for your real estate outsourcing business, am I right? Uh, that's 100% correct. Right, okay. Um, so what stood you apart from other players in the industry? I I'm guessing it was fairly competitive. Oh, most definitely. Uh, the, uh, the whole concept of outsourcing in 1991 was uh, uh, considered a risk. It was new to the world. Uh, in, today's, uh, in, in today's parlance, you would refer to it as disruptive. Uh, it didn't exist, and it was a threat, frankly, to the people you would be selling it to because, in effect, you would be saying, I can do your job better than your staff can do the job for the corporations we were serving. But in, in the 90s, the mantra amongst corporations was do more with less. So the outsourcing model fit very well into that. Not only did it cost less money, not only did it provide a higher level of service, but it required less people to be on the corporate side and more people to be on the service provider side. Right. And was that different to what your competition were offering? Well, the competition was, uh, frankly, late to the game of outsourcing. There was ah. a traditional way of doing business, which was kind of one-off in local markets. If somebody needed to find a space to operate their business, they would find somebody in a local market and go hire them, and they would then hire an architect and a project manager and build out the space, whereas our business was uh, selling a full suite solution to a central point at the corporate level and uh, basically asking for all their business wherever they operated, no matter what city, no matter where it was located around the world. And uh, that was the way the real estate outsourcing model worked. Oh, brilliant. So what are or were at the time your own key skills in, in being able to run and scale that business? I would say uh, uh, first, uh, I really understood the mechanics of the business model uh, really how to make money in doing what I was uh, challenging myself to do. Uh, I understood that there were really three things that we did, source new accounts, manage accounts, and then deliver against every commitment. Um, probably the other thing is uh, uh, I, I knew uh, the competition, I knew where we were different, and uh, the, the combination of those two things really helped set the business apart. And what are the areas of, of skill that you needed in the business that you didn't have? We can't be good at everything. Probably uh, the most significant thing was being open to hire uh, people, uh, uh, bright uh, people that had similar goals and aspirations I did, that wanted to be associated with a, a new growing business, was comfortable with uh, getting into a disruptive space like outsourcing and, um, and, and being willing to, uh, uh, I started my own business because I wanted the equity and I wanted an opportunity to build it and I recognized they did too. Uh, so the uh, key strategic players were given equity uh, which motivated their performance and many times uh, some of those players would challenged me and I had to bite down hard because the value of their contribution was greater than some of the upset or indigestion their recommendations were creating. All right. mm, interesting. Uh, financial management uh, is key in any business, uh, certainly when you're scaling it. Um, how important was financial management systems and processes in, in your empire? Uh, exceedingly important and not just in mine but any entrepreneur that starts a business, uh, my strongest recommendation is uh, that they stay very close to the money. Uh, so many businesses start up without uh, having a tight control over how much are they spending versus how much they're making versus how long it's going to get to break even in their business. So my financial review during the first year of operation, I reviewed financial reports literally on a daily basis, what, how we were making money, what our balance sheet looked like, what our cash flow was. Literally every night I would look at that and then throughout the life of the business over 14 years I would get a weekly report 
that had an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. That would be number one. Number two is um, I think when you start to experience success, your desire is uh, sometimes to pay yourself more, and uh, we maintained a strict discipline to keep our salaries flat uh, pretty much for the first three years of operation, and we just built a war chest of retained earnings so that we could invest in the business. And uh, uh, that was probably one of the uh, critical success factors for our business versus the competition. Mm, fascinating. So you ended up um, in a exit strategy that was a commercial sale. Was that part of the original vision for the business, that you would scale it and then sell it to a bigger player? No, I, I didn't have that idea at all. I was so excited to start my business. I thought I would own it forever. It would pass down through the generations of my family, and it just never entered my head. Uh, and, and it really didn't even uh, become a consideration until about 10 years into the, bit, the life of the business. Um, and, and that's something that I feel strongly about. Sometimes I meet entrepreneurs that think, oh, I'll build this business and then I'll flip it and make millions of dollars. And uh, I think the more successful businesses are the people that feel like, uh, you know, they want to be part of the business for the long term. And I think the employees and other members of the team feel that. And, uh, you know, inevitably, uh, like in the case of our business, about 10 years out, we were pursuing frankly, a large public corporation that we were going to buy private, merge it with our business. We got to know an investment banker. They got to know us. We liked one another. And a couple of years later, uh, we had suitors uh, approaching us. Uh, the reason why we chose to sell, I looked over my shoulder uh, at my children and realized they were, uh, frankly, still in high school. So uh, and, and the competition was slowly starting to nip at our heels, and I realized if we are going to um, become a large global player, we're either going to have to buy a large business or we're going to have to sell ourselves to a large business. Um, a fine company, Johnson Controls, approached us, uh, called us in September of 2004, and said, um, we'd like to buy your business. Uh, they bought it in June of 05, and two weeks later, they asked me to run the combined business for them. Wow. So the question that everyone will want to know is, did you make a stack of money when you sold out before you ran the, the new entity? Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you find going from being owning your own business to being the CEO of the merged business where someone else then owned you. Change of dynamic, I would have thought. It was a tremendous change. As a matter of fact, it was a step back to the days when I started with IBM and HP. I liked those companies, but they were big companies, and they were bulky, and the decision-making processes were different. I no longer had control. Uh, I was a member of the team. I did run a large chunk of the business. It was about $1.5 billion in sales, uh, the newly merged business. And um, but but I I I really missed the entrepreneurial where you have your hands directly involved in the mechanics of the business uh, and that you have control, particularly on the judgments and decisions that needed to be made. Uh, within a large company, it's more consensus oriented. Uh, frankly, human resources uh, plays a greater role across businesses, um, and you don't just don't have if you will, the customized or tailoring approach to the way in which you run the business. So I missed that greatly, and uh, the way the contract was written after a two-and-a-half-year stay back, I had the opportunity to step away. I chose to do that, and I immediately started uh, another uh, entrepreneurial business. So now tell me about the angel investing work that you're doing as, as well as all the other uh, activities in your world. What types of, of businesses are, are you funding at present? Okay, uh, probably there's, uh, first I'm open to uh, the presentation of uh, any good idea. One of the reasons why we wrote the book, uh, the book uh, that we're bringing to market in the summer, this summer 2015, is called The Purpose is Profit. 
And uh, the way that connects back to angel investing is many times people will approach me and say, hey, I'd like you to invest in my business. And I, my first reaction to them is, I'd like you to read some of the principles of the way I think so that you know who you're potentially getting in bed with. Mm -hmm. uh, so they understand the way I believe uh, I would manage, help, mentor, operate, support the businesses that I invest in. And I think that's very important because you really need to know what's important to the person uh, that's investing in you, uh, just like uh, the investor needs to know what kind of business and people they're investing in. Mm. Mm. So are you investing in, in businesses across the world or, or mostly America-centric? Um, Right now, I'm investing primarily in three areas. One is in real estate, uh, both uh, land and development projects. I'm investing in uh, internet-based ventures. Uh, the most recent uh, investment I made is in an exciting and fun company. Uh, it's called Collector's Cafe, and it's actually tied into a global TV show that uh, brings uh, the collectibles market to the internet so that people can buy and sell collectibles and uh, each time they buy or sell they're uh, given an insurance policy for the value uh, and authenticity of what they're buying. Ooh, I need to know more about that. I love collectibles. So um, yes, I look forward to hearing more about that one. So tell me, um, you must see a lot of businesses in that they come to you for, for angel um, funding. What are some of the key mistakes that you are seeing uh, being made by startups or, or even scale-ups in, in the businesses that you consider or reject? Sure. Um, well, first, I, I personally look for what I call the big three. And the big three for an entrepreneur is, uh, number one, do they have a strong support system, whether that's their husband or their wife? Are they a team? Are they fully committed? Whether the husband or wife is involved in the business or not, they need to know that they can uh, invest the time to make their new uh, venture lift off. So the big three is a strong support system, a willingness to sacrifice. Uh, and as oftentimes there's the talk and there's the walk. The talk is I'm willing to sacrifice. The walk is I genuinely have sacrificed, I will sacrifice, because sacrifice is painful and you're giving something up when you sacrifice. And you really have to have the stomach to sacrifice. And the last is a powerful work ethic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, people that, again, uh, are willing to do whatever it takes to make their business succeed. So I, I, I refer to those as the big three, a strong support system, a willingness to sacrifice, and a powerful work ethic. The other things that I look for is, do they have a clear understanding of how they make money? Um, many businesses nowadays talk about um, getting eyeballs or, or getting uh, uh, some type of uh, measurement other than how they can actually generate a profit. Monetizing, yes, I agree. And I think that's very important. I mean, obviously, you're putting your family and your life on the line. You're starting your business. and uh, you need to make sure that it's going to be a success. That's frankly why we called our book The Purpose is Profit. Mm -hmm. So those, those are a couple of the things that I look for. Mm, brilliant. So your book The Purpose is Profit is coming out in summer uh, of this year, 2015. Uh, tell me a little bit more about it. I'm sure um, our listeners will be interested in, in, in what you have to say. Sure. Um, Frankly, it's not a uh, change the world visionary book. In other words, this book is not for people that want to create the next Facebook. It's for people that really want to understand the mechanics of how to put uh, their money on the line, or the, or their friends and family's money with them, uh, that are concerned about succeeding and making a profit and building a profitable business. It really gets into the mechanics, what I call the gears and levers of a startup. Um, I think oftentimes people take their eye off the ball on that, so this really gets into the grassroots. What's maybe a little different is 
we use a, a true story to explain chapter by chapter, uh, not only teaching the mechanics, but also giving examples of the mechanics in action and both covering both good decisions and bad decisions. For example, one chapter is called The Passion Project. And basically, uh, we oftentimes hear, pursue your passion and you're sure to make a profit. And this chapter says, uh, basically, um, the passion is not necessarily the answer. Um, the ideal business is a combination of passion and distinctive competence. But if I had to choose one or the other, I would choose distinctive competence as the pathway to make a successful business. And if I, if I, if some people are fortunate where they have both. Um, I mentioned earlier that one of the businesses was a publication, and I had a tremendous passion, almost a blinding passion for it. Uh, and frankly, it drank all the profits of the outsourcing business where I truly did have distinctive competence, but maybe not as much passion. And then finally we realized, heck, this is a great business. Uh, we should shut down the business that's consuming all the profits and, uh, and, and just lift off the outsourcing business, which is what we did. Brilliant. And is your book going to be available on Amazon or is it available in any other place in the meantime as, as, as an early copy? Yes, uh, the book will be available on Amazon in print. Uh, in addition to that, we're offering a pre-release copy of The Purpose is Profit, which gives the readers a flavor of what the actual full release of the book will be about. Uh, you can secure a free copy of the pre-release in electronic format by going to our website, www.thepurposeisprofit.com. I'll make sure that that's um, on the web on my website as well, so that um, in case anybody misses it. So, what have been your biggest or most pleasurable successes in in business to date? You know, I I, uh, uh, I would probably say uh, working with uh, a talented group of people that I'm still friends with. Uh, we were fortunate in making. Uh, all of our senior partners, multimillionaires, um, we spread the equity. We all benefited. Uh, we did get some nice accolades. We were an Inc. 500 company. We secured, as you mentioned, the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Um, and so from a business standpoint, uh, uh, that's what I would say has been our, our greatest success. On a personal front, um, uh, the sacrifices I made uh, to lift off my business, uh, for, fortunate have uh, reverted themselves into allowing me to pursue angel investing, working with entrepreneurs, and frankly, most importantly, spending time with my family. Mm, great. And during that journey, did you have coaches, mentors supporting you to help you to achieve the success that you did? Uh, most definitely. Um, one of our early mentors was very interesting. We uh, we were looking for space to open up our new startup, and there was a gentleman named John Stanger, and uh, he was closing down his business, and uh, we negotiated a deal with him where he handed us the keys and said, you can keep the desks, the copiers, take over the lease. It only had 18 months left on it. And, but we talked to him and got to know him, and uh, in the corner of his office, there was a picture of him on the cover of Time magazine, and we were blown away. This gentleman working for this small uh, private equity firm, we said, what's this picture? And he said, I used to be uh, chairman of uh, General Electric Capital. Mm. And we said, uh, uh, well, look, John, do you have any advice for us? And he, he said, uh, I said, you know, can you tell us three things that would be the most important thing we should do? And he looked at us, he was quiet, and he said, I can tell you three things, and they are this. Do it, do it, do it. That is exactly what he said. One of the chapters in our book is dedicated to him. We asked him why he would say that, and he said, out of all the years I worked at General Electric, I had more fun and more freedom and made more money and made more contacts after I left than during the time that I was there. Wow. Mm, fascinating. So based on your experience, if you had three key, key, 
three key pieces of advice to give someone setting up in business uh, or scaling up their business, what would that be based on your experience? I would say, uh, number one, uh, making sure you understand how you're going to make money and how you're going to generate a profit. Uh, number two would be how much funding you're going to need to reach break even. Uh, very important. And it's a little scary if you haven't started a business before to think through how much money you're going to consume until your revenue exceeds your expense line. But it's very important to do that and be somewhat conservative in that. Number three, make sure you have strong business partners that are willing to work with you in the trenches. And the last thing is the big three. You've got to have a strong support system, somebody who's willing to fight the good fight with you, uh, a, a, a genuine willingness to sacrifice, and a, and a powerful work ethic. Brilliant. So what about you personally? What are your own uh, personal goals for the next three or more years? Um, probably the number one thing that I've been doing is uh, mentoring and advising family and friends in realizing their goals and aspirations, whether they're entrepreneurial or otherwise. Um, I've been spending time giving back. Uh, I'm on a, uh, the board of governors of a hospital, and uh, I, I get involved in, in charities, uh, uh, develop the Breast Cancer Research Fund. So on the personal front, that's what I do. Um, but the way I got uh, to the point of writing the book is when I sold my business and I had left Johnson Controls, a couple of people came up to me and said, hey, we think you would be a great teacher, uh, and, and we think you should do that. And uh, I remembered how I behaved in school, and I thought, uh, I don't know if I could teach people like myself, but I, but I thought maybe I should write a book that would uh, really boil down the key learnings and doing it in an interesting way where there's a story and there's learnings, and there's some fun to it as well. And that's why uh, we chose to write the book, the title, The Purpose is Profit, the subtitle, The Truth About Starting and Building Your Own Business. Mm, can't wait to read it. So one final question. I don't know about you, but I plan to be at least 101 years old, and I'm going to be sit sitting in my rocking chair after a busy day working and dancing and all the other things I want to do. And if you're going to be doing that too, at that stage in your life, what will give you the grace reason to s smile about what's gone before in your life? I would say number one, most importantly, is my, my family, um, that we have a, a good relationship, uh, that when I'm 101, that's going to be the most important thing. Uh, uh, and, and so I want to invest and I want to protect that so that I know there's warm feelings uh, that go well beyond uh, my time on earth here. Um, the second thing would be um, helping people achieve their goals. Uh, it's very rewarding. We've worked with so many entrepreneurs already uh, with our blog. Uh, they've gotten inspiration, and, and it's, it's really rewarding when people acknowledge and say, wow, some of your words have really helped me think through complex problems and motivated me when I felt like I was at my darkest hour to continue to work through and find the light at the end of the tunnel. And then um, lastly, uh, knowing that I had achieved my goals. And um, one of the things I really like to say when people say, well, well, who are you at the end of the day? And, 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 and I, I, you know, um, it's, it's easy to present yourself as being a, a personable person. I, I, I probably can be a little tough in, in certain occasions. But one thing I do know that I always say, uh, written on my gravestone, I want there to be written that I fulfilled every commitment I ever made. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you certainly fulfilled the commitment in talking to me today. I really, really appreciate the time, and I know that the listeners are going to take a lot from what you've said uh, around entrepreneurship and the journey of entrepreneurship. It's been really, really fascinating, and I thank you for uh, the time you've given to, to share your story. Thanks so much, Adele. I really appreciate this opportunity as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ed. I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Bye.